Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How is everyone doing? <clears throat> Has anybody noticed electronics acting weird lately? Like, especially the last few days. Ah, okay, my wife's getting stuff for dinner. Um, especially the last few days, probably the last three or four days. You notice, like, cell phones acting weird, like they're slowing down or like they're having a problem loading pages or something, or even if you're on a computer on the internet, notice that it seems like things are acting weird. I wonder if something's going on. I wonder if there's something happening that they haven't been talking about, as in the solar situation, you know, the sun acting up the way it is, or, or something else. It's weird. <laughs> I know there's a lot of hackers busy right now, so. I'm just curious if anybody else noticed if it seems like, like when I tried to load this up and I went to open it and it started to open part way and paused and then finished opening. And I'm starting to notice an uptick in that stuff. And this is just something I noticed. Anyway, guys, if you don't know, if you don't know the power of prayer, and I'm sure you guys do, but it, it is the glory to God for us to talk about stuff like this. Go look at uh, YB's comment uh, from yesterday. And... I think it was morning devotion and she was talking about her garden that they planted, that they planted late and how much they're getting out of that garden because they prayed over it. And, it, and the blessing the Lord poured out on them is being shared with their neighbors and their friends because they're able to share it with others. Guys, the, the power of prayer is, it's a powerful thing. And the Bible even has a verse that talks about the, the prayer of the righteous has great power while it's working. This is why we pray almost every video. These morning and evening devotions, I know I don't pray in every evening devotion. We pray in almost every video because prayer is powerful. Very powerful. And that's evident by the testimony I gave of the praise report yesterday. Still waiting to hear on the second half of that. This morning, though, we're going to be reading out of Zechariah 1.8, the myrtle trees that were in the bottom. Now, this is interesting. I did this book. I have a playlist of this book. And this is interesting. Verse 8, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse, and it stood among the myrtle trees in the hollow, and behind him were horses, red, sorrel, and white. This is very reminiscent of the book of Revelation, reminiscent of the four horsemen. But let's go up here. Like I said, we're not going to get deep into this here, but uh, we can touch just briefly on it. Let's go up and read context. We're just going to start in verse 1 because it puts us right there anyway. A call to return to the Lord. Verse 1, in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of uh, Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet, saying, the Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets preach, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, turn now from your evil ways and your evil deeds. But they did not hear nor heed me, says the Lord. <coughs> and we covered most of those prophets already. I have playlists on all that. Verse 5, your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? Yet surely my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they returned and said, just as the Lord of hosts determined to do to us according to our ways and according to our deeds, so he has dealt with us. The Lord said it was going to be this way, and it was this way. What the Lord said he would do, he will do. And so what he has said he's going to do in the future, he's going to do. The tribulation is coming and a great many people are going to find themselves on the wrong side of it. A vision of a horseman, verse 7, on the 24th day of the 11th month. So he's giving you a timestamp, which is the month Shabbat in the second year of Darius. The word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet. I saw by night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse, and it stood among the myrtle trees in the hollow. Now, there's actually some pretty interesting significance behind the myrtle trees. 
stood among the myrtle trees in the hollow, and behind him were horses, red, sorrel, and white. Then I said, My lord, what are these? So the angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you who they are. And the man who stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are the ones whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro throughout the earth. So they answered the angel of the Lord who stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro throughout the earth, and behold, all the earth is resting quietly. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which you were angry these seventy years? Interesting to note, who is this talking? The angel of the Lord. Well, who was the angel of the Lord throughout the whole Old Testament? Jesus. In verse 12, he capitalized angel. Now, further up, he didn't. But in verse 12, he capitalized the angel. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which you were angry these 70 years? Verse 13, and the Lord answered the angel who talked with me with good and comforting words. So the angel who spoke with me said to me, proclaim saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, I'm zealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great zeal. How interesting. That's the same thing that is said about Jesus. Zeal for your house has eaten me up. Same thing. I am exceedingly angry with the nations at ease, for I was a little angry, and they helped, but with evil intent. What They did what they were supposed to do, but their hearts weren't in the right place. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, says the Lord of hosts, and a surveyor's line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Again proclaim, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, my cities shall again spread out through prosperity. The Lord will again comfort Zion and will again choose Jerusalem. Zechariah is an amazing book. And the video series I've did on all these prophets has just touched on it. But it's enough to should that should in, it should instigate further study. And they are very good books to study because Jesus in the New Testament constantly points us back to the old prophets. The vision in this chapter describes the condition of Israel in Zechariah's day, but being interpreted in its aspect toward us, it describes the church of God as we find it now in the world. The church is compared to a myrtle grove. I told you there's more significance to those myrtle trees. It's compared to a myrtle grove flourishing in a valley. It is hidden, unobserved, secreted. So, you know, a lot of people talk about, yeah, there's this place down in this valley over here. You can't see it from any other angle. Uh, you can only, you only know about it if you go there. We used to have a place like that in Oklahoma we used to go to. There was this place called Hayburn Lake, big catfishing spot, big old muddy lake. But it had a spillway, and if you were, if you went on the other side of the road, there was a little sign, and it said Browns Creek. And there was a little pull-off down there. And a lot of people knew about it, but almost nobody went there. And this is what was amazing, is that the whole lake was just muddy beyond belief. But when you went down that little road and turned and went down underneath there, the creek ran on a stone ledge coming out from the lake and was crystal clear water. And it spilled down over this beautiful little tiny waterfall I don't know, it was probably about, I don't know, 30 feet tall. And it had this big pool, and it was loaded with fish. We used to go down and go fishing all the time. I used to go up on the top in the cracks in the rocks and drop little spinners in there and catch big old fat perch out of there. Big old crappie and stuff. But if you didn't know it was there, you'd say, Browns Creek, okay, that's the spillway from the lake, and you just keep on going. If you didn't know that beautiful little spot was there, people didn't go there because you couldn't see it. It was hidden. This is what's going on here. The church is hidden down in this valley that you can't see it openly. You can't easily identify it. It's a hidden spot. It's a secret spot. And they're all there in that secret spot. It is hidden, unobserved, and secreted. Courting no honor and attracting no observation from the careless gazer. That's today. That's the church today. Because most people don't pay attention. You know what they see when they talk about the church? Everything that they see that's popular and being shown on TV. All the people that are standing in the limelight that the media is going after and talking to. <clears throat> not, not us. 
The church, like her head, has a glory, but it is concealed from carnal eyes. For the time of her breaking forth in all her splendor is not yet come. That would be the birth of the child from Israel. Remember the Revelation 12 sign. That child is us. Child is the church. Time of her splendor is not yet come. The idea of tranquil security is also suggested to us, for the myrtle grove in the valley is still and calm while the storm sweeps over the mountain summits. Tempests spend their force upon the craggy peaks of the Alps, basically the mountains. And what does the Bible refer to? use mountains to refer to? Leaderships. Look at what's happening with our leaders today. But down yonder where flows the stream which maketh glad the city of our God, the myrtles flourish by the still waters, all unshaken by the impetuous wind. Does it not seem like, like that now? Even look at the world that's going on. <clears throat> look at what's happening with the world today. Look at what's going on out there. But you come back home and you come back to your little spot. And, see, and also there's a sense of calm. It's like the Lord has put a hedge around this spot where I'm at. And I think a lot of us can talk about that. That the Lord is putting us in these wonderfully peaceful situations. Even if it's just our own home. Even if it's just the area we live in. And it's suddenly quiet. Out here it's just amazingly quiet where I'm at. There are a lot of people that live out here. It's very peaceful and very quiet. Go into town, hold up a story. So he's got us all in these little spots, these little hidden areas. This is something I haven't actually, because me and Nina have been talking about a specific situation she's enduring right now, and I haven't gotten permission to share any of that yet, and I'm going to wait until I see the outcome of it before I share any of it, uh, and if she gives me permission, share it. But it's been amazing what she's been doing, and I have been, have not, you know, address that with her yet in phone calls because there's a uh, this right here is what this is leading me to believe the Lord is doing in her particular life right now is moving her to a place where there's it's quiet and there's no turmoil I think he's doing that with all of us in one way or another creating these little oases for us to hang out in until it's time to go how great is the inward tranquility of God's church and that's another thing the peace that defies all understanding. Even when opposed and persecuted, she has a peace which the world gives not, and which, therefore, it cannot take away. The peace of God, which paths all understanding, keeps the hearts and minds of God's people. That's the, that's the verse. Does not the metaphor forcibly picture the peaceful, perpetual growth of the saints? The myrtle sheds not her leaves. She is always green. And it is an, a myrtle tree is an evergreen. And the church, in her worst time, still had the blessed verdure, or verdure of grace about her. Nay, she has sometimes exhibited most verdure, or verdure, I, th I think that's endurance, when her winter has been sharpest. Sometimes the hardest winter brings the best growth on the trees in the spring. She has... There's a hint to spring again. She has proposed most when her adversaries have been most severe. Hence, the text hints at victory. You ever notice that when you trim a tree back, and I've talked about this before, because about a peach tree at my mom's old house she had, you cut that thing back hard, and those are the sweetest peaches you ever had in your life. You trim back a myrtle tree, and it has so much better growth later. Um, if you know what a lantana is, we have them grow, they grow wild out here all over the place. Massive flowers. Well, I dug one up one time and planted it out front. And it had, it always got a little green on it, but it never looked that good. And I was like, we got to trim this thing back. And you, like with lantanas, when they're big, you, because the, the growth comes back on the old growth, but you trim them back, they grow a lot of new growth. And so at a certain time of year, you go through there and trim them down almost to the ground. Trim them back real hard. And boy, they will explode with new growth. Sometimes that hard tribulation, sometimes those hard times create the greatest growth in a Christian. We have something in nature that actually reveals that to us. Hence the text hints at victory. The myrtle is an emblem of peace and a significant token of triumph. The brows of conquerors were bound with myrtle and with laurel. And is not the church ever victorious? 
Is not every Christian more than a conqueror through him that loved him? Living in peace, do not the saints fall asleep in the arms of victory? And it is victory we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. See, I told you that verse 8, myrtle trees had more significance. There's so much in this word we can't even cover it all. It's impossible. In a thousand years of me doing videos like this and covering this, we will never cover everything contained within this. And that's doing a video or two every day. It's just impossible. There's so much here. Because the deeper you look, the more you find. But the overarching topic, the overarching emphasis that is in the Bible is the victory of the saints. The ever-present overwhelming victory of our Lord over everything. Now, the carnal world can't see it. They don't want to see it. The unbeliever can't see it. They don't want to see it. But the believer knows this truth because when they start to read that Bible and the Lord starts to reveal it to them, and it takes reading the Bible to learn this and come to that place where you see it. I didn't come to a place of understanding by not reading the Bible. I did it from reading the Bible. <laughs> I didn't come to a place of growth by not reading scriptures. I came to that place by reading the scriptures. If I would have diligently read the Bible 20 years ago, I would have been a different person that whole 20 years. It's because I wasn't diligent that I made that mistake. And I, and I learned from it. And some of those lessons were painful. But here we are now. He got me opening that book up and reading that book and everything has been different. This is why the whole heart of this ministry has been to read, read, read the Bible. That's the message I was given. Read, tell them, read, read, read the Bible. Read my scriptures. Because when we do, it changes our communication. It changes our ideology. It changes our attitude. It changes how we think and see and view things. And so now, now we start to look at the world and start to see things as they really are. And we start to see examples of his hands working in the very things that surround us. The very creation declares the greatness of God. Hence the myrtle trees. Hence the lantanas. Hence the peach trees. We have lessons to learn all over and it all goes perfectly well with this word of God. How amazing that we have this wonderful gift and our understanding is so short that we struggle to even fully grasp or know what is being told to us here. But what an amazing event it is whenever he reveals something to us and we are like, wait a minute, I've been looking at this this whole time. How is that possible? The longer a Christian goes in life, the more vibrant they become and the more, the stronger they become and the more about them is godly as you look at them and watch how they move. We can't help but grow in Christ. If you know anything about chili patines, little bitty pepper plant, down here they grow wild, they're everywhere. Um, and the people that know, know that if you keep that plant cultivated and the longer you protect it and keep it going, it'll get fairly, it gets, turns into a little tree, not super high, a couple feet tall. But um, the longer that plant is allowed to grow, the stronger the those little peppers get. They're little tiny little peppers. And like one pepper will flavor a gallon of chili. And a lot of, a lot of people use that down here to season up their, their chili and make it hotter. They're pretty warm. Uh, my mom has one out in front of her place. And I was like, these look like chili patines. And I pulled it off and I bit into one of the peppers. And I was like, yep, that's chili patines. <laughs> but the longer you let them go, the stronger they get. The longer we go in Christ, the stronger we get. Not because of us, but because of him. He grows us in that. That chili patine doesn't grow stronger because of itself, but because of external circumstances. It was allowed to stay up. Most people mow it down. It was allowed to stay up longer. It was allowed nutrients. It was allowed water. So outside circumstances brought that plant up and made that plant stronger. Same thing happens to us. Those outside circumstances are the things of the world, which are used by God to change us and make us better. The tribulations and the trials we go through are made to grow us, are intended for our good. God said, I forget where the verse is. You meant it for evil. I mean it for good. 
And he uses this because it says in the New Testament, all things work for the good of those that love him. And so he uses these things to grow us, to make us better, to bring us into a place where you will know a peace you never realized you was even possible. And some of you have already hit that spot and you're, and you're just getting into it or you've been in it for a little while and you're realizing, wow, I, I never realized it, but now I can see it. Now I can sense it, that peace that defies all understanding, that joy inexpressible, that you have this joy even when you feel bad, even when you're sad, depressed, down, you still have that joy and you have a sense of that joy. You can, you can almost see it. That's the Lord. That's what he's doing. What an amazing thing to have this right there. And we never knew it was there until the Lord made, revealed it to us through this word. Until he opened this up so that we could see it. And the more I look at what's going on out there, the more I realize he is hiding us. He's hiding us in these little myrtle groves all around the world. He's keeping us in these little secret places. I think he's separated us on purpose. I think he's hiding us on purpose keeping us out of, for the most part, the public's view. And we're spread all over the earth. And when the time is right, he'll remove us. And it's so incredible to stop and think about that. Because you look at your life and you look at what's going on around you, you start to see some of these things I'm talking about. You start to realize, wait a minute, this is actually, this is real. This is happening. The Lord is hiding us in these little myrtle groves, down in these bottom areas, in these hollows. Nobody knows what's going on. Nobody sees. Nobody can identify us. Now, the, the individuals will meet us. But the grand, uh, the whole grand scheme of things doesn't know where we are. I think that's, that's on purpose. He, he hides us out from Satan a lot of times, I think. Maybe. It's amazing. I remember um, an episode of the Antiques Roadshow. And a guy had brought in this stuff he had uh, from his great great granddad or something like that and he lived a really long time and he had this little notebook and some other memorabilia and looking at it they were like this is this is very interesting um and what they you know they're reading some of the stuff in there well evidently this guy served under custer and at little bighorn he ended up not going for some reason i forget what the reason was but he went with him all the way to that point. And he was noting things. Well, in one of his notes in his notebook, he noted that two of the uh, lower ranks went up this, they were chasing some of the Indians up into this hollow. And the rest of them kept going. Well, they never saw those guys again. And so when they took his notebook, they went and they traced that spot back and they went up in that hollow and they found both those guys skeletons and their clothing and buckles and stuff like that and, and their their stuff up there right up inside that hollow up, up under a tree those indians got the best of them and took them guys out but they were hidden in that hollow nobody ever knew they were there nobody ever found them there and you know n nobody even knew this place existed it was hidden little things like that i i start to think about because when that talks about this in here how the lord is keeping us hidden nobody even knows where we are Nobody's even aware of it. People forget about us. And I used to take that to heart. People would just, oh, they'll forget about me. And it, and it was bothersome, you know, that, that I was that forgettable, or forgetful of a person. That people would just forget about me. I was that forgettable. But now I realize that the Lord's doing that on purpose. He's making people to forget about us. People that pass through our lives. People that we used to know. People that abandon us because we were, we're Christians. And they forget about us because the Lord's making them forget about us. Hiding us in plain sight. Amazing. What an amazing thing. More and more, the, the more you contemplate it, the more so many things start to make sense. And this is just the glory of the Lord being revealed. In us. 
and in what he's doing in our lives. Now, if you're listening to this or watching this and you don't see the, these things I'm mentioning, just wait. The Lord will reveal them. <laughs> He'll start to show these things. And you'll start to see his hand working in everything. Everything going on in your life. Because he cares for us. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory. And to lift you up and sing praises unto your holy name. Father, thank you for this holy word and thank you for this devotion. I thank you, Father, that you hide us away. That you've kept us hidden and protected. That you keep us in these little areas, these little myrtle groves, these little hollows hidden around the world. But you, you have us spread out. Some of us are together with other true believers, but a lot of us are just spread out here and there. Because of one thing or another, we've either been alienated or had to alienate ourselves from a great, great bit of what's around us because of the situation we may be in, but you have hedged us about, you've protected us, you're watching over us. And what a blessing it is to learn this and to realize this. What a blessing it is to know you care for us so much that you would protect us right out in the open, that you would watch over us right out in the full view of the public, that they would see it and not even realize what they were saying. Man will have no excuse. Father, I thank you that you are watching over us, protecting us, keeping us till that day comes. I regret that we miss a lot of the divine appointments. We miss a lot of opportunities, but we, we grab a hold of a lot of them too. But I think you already know all that. I think you're already well aware of all that. What our concerns are, what our desires are, what our troubles are, what eats on us, our very close, intimate, deepest thoughts. And you work all these things around that. The Lord, make us to speak out more about this. Make us to be more open with you about these things. As For as much as you hide us in these quote-unquote myrtle groves, make us to expose ourselves to you the, at least that much, if not more. And be honest with you and open with you and tell you these things and share with you these things and come to you in gratitude and thanksgiving for these things that you do for us, known and unknown. I'm thankful that you hide us. I'm thankful that you keep us. I'm thankful that you watch over us. I can go on and on about all the wonderful things that you've done in our lives here on this little acre and a half. And everywhere else we've been. Things that should have happened and, did, and, and then they didn't. Directions we should have gone and we didn't. And the times you stopped me from making stupid mistakes. And through all of it have kept us going, kept us strong, kept us moving, kept us encouraged. And even more now, more and more now, you encourage us. And keep us going and keep us fed and clothed and watched over. Your mercy knows no limit and endures forever. Your providence and your blessings know no limit and endure forever. Thank you, Father. Thank you for these wonderful blessings. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for teaching us and showing us and leading us in these things. And for having your hand on each of us, showing us the way, leading us down the path where we should go, directing our steps. And then we have your word as a light, as a lamp to our feet, to our steps, to the path in front of us, so we can find our way. The glory is all yours, Lord. The glory and the honor is all yours, Father. And you are worthy of them, more than worthy. Thank you, Father, for your mercy and grace. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for your free gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. And in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for morning devotion. It is amazing to know that our Lord, that even in the middle of all of this, he has kind of hidden us away in these little pockets. And most people drive past our house or pass us in the store and don't even know. 
He has hidden us in plain sight. But there's a day coming when all will be revealed. And it will be incredible that when it is all revealed and everyone sees things as they really are, it's going to be a stark contrast to what it is, how it is now. Then we will be revealed to all creation. The Bible says in the New Testament, all of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God because then creation will be removed or released from, from the, its futility. And the glory of God will shine and show in all things openly for everyone to see clearly. And we will become that glorified church that the Lord is creating for all to see. There's an amazing day coming, a day of redemption. We're all eagerly waiting for it. Let's keep watching. Let's keep waiting. Let's keep looking and moving towards that, that day, towards that time frame when everything changes. Together, as believers. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name, and I'll see you in the next video.